The following video is being pulled from the Wood Whisperer Guild archive for your viewing pleasure. For more high quality videos like this one, join today at woodwhisperer-guild.com. The Wood Whisperer is brought to you by Powermatic, the gold standard since 1921, and by Rockler Woodworking and Hardware. Create with confidence. Today, it's all about dies. Now in preparation for this video, I went back into all my old finishing books and looked specifically at how they covered the world of dyes. Some get more technical, like Jewett and Flexner, and some stay more general, like Dresner. But the deeper I dug into the topic, the more I realized how frustrating and confusing this would be to someone who just wants to know what a particular bottle of dye is going to do on the wood. Getting bogged down in the heavy terminology and the chemistry is exactly the thing that may stop someone from using dyes in the first place, and that would be a real shame. So, I'm going to do my best to give you a digestible chunk of information while empowering you to pick up any bottle of dye and know what to expect simply by looking at its ingredients. So what is dye anyway? Well, dyes are really just very small particles of color. They dissolve in solvents like water, mineral spirits, and alcohol, and don't require a binder of any type to adhere to the wood. So really, all you need is the dye and a solvent, and you can make your own dye mixture. So why use dye in the first place? Well, dyes absorb deeply into the wood and they provide a very clean, clear, and vivid color without distorting or hiding the grain in any way at all. And because the dye usually doesn't have a binder in the mix, it doesn't seal off the wood. So you can apply layer after layer of different colors, making for a really deep, rich color effect. You can also combine the dyes to make an infinite number of color shades. And you can even add them to your top coat to add just that little bit of extra color to your projects. Now dyes come in three basic forms. First, there's powder, and these are usually either water, alcohol, or oil soluble. Next, there's ready to use liquids, and typically these are labeled NGRs or non-grain raising. This one happens to not be, we'll talk about that one later. And they also come in the form of a concentrate, like a trans tint here. This can be diluted to make a really nice stain, or it can be added directly to a top coat, and you can use that for toning. Now the terminology can get a little confusing, so I'll try to explain a few things that you'll want to know so you can pick up just about any bottle of dye and know exactly how it's going to behave just by reading the ingredients list or the MSDS. Now an MSDS is a material safety data sheet, and that's something you should get comfortable reading as a finisher. Not only does it give you important safety info, it can also tell you exactly what's in the product, even if the outside label doesn't. And our job as finishers is always to be smarter than the marketers. So I mentioned NGRs, or non-grain raising dyes, earlier. Many of the pre-mixed liquid dyes that we buy will be labeled as NGRs. So why do we need these at all? Well, because water-based dyes have a very annoying flaw. The water in a dye mixture causes the wood to become all rough and fuzzy, which is really not a good thing for a surface that we're trying to finish. So in order to avoid this, we have to pre-raise the grain by wetting the wood ahead of time, letting it dry, and sanding it one more time to knock down all those little fuzzies. And since the wood generally only raises its grain once, you can then apply the water-based dye with little to no grain raising. But wouldn't it be great if you didn't have to pre-raise the grain at all? Well, that's where the NGRs come in. These are usually a special mixture of the dye with some kind of solvent that contains little to no water, like alcohol. And as a result, it doesn't raise the grain. Now, technically, you can just take an alcohol or oil-soluble powder dye and mix your own non-grain raising dye, but the products sold as NGRs typically have a little more going on chemically. Now let's talk about some of the stuff that you might see on an MSDS and what it means to you. Now some of the pre-mixed liquid dyes and concentrates will have glycol ethers listed on the MSDS. Now don't be intimidated by a chemical name. This is just the name for a family of very special solvents. I'll give you a few examples and it should help you understand how this stuff works. For instance, water-soluble dye powder will not dissolve in mineral spirits. That just makes sense. But it will dissolve in glycol ether. And the cool part is that the glycol ether dye solution is now compatible with a number of other solvents, including the mineral spirits that wouldn't dissolve the original dye. This is actually how trans-tint concentrated dyes work. 
If you read the label, you'll see that it dissolves in just about anything, and the glycol ether is the primary reason why this works. Now another example that really has nothing to do with dyes, but you might find interesting, involves waterborne finishes. Now polyurethane and acrylic resins don't dissolve in water, but they do dissolve in glycol ethers. And the glycol ethers can then be put into a water solution, and the water serves as a carrier. That's why the term is waterborne. So remember that just because it's waterborne doesn't mean that it's solvent-free. You still need to protect yourself. Now another thing to look out for on an MSDS is a binder. Something like linseed oil for oil-based dyes or acrylic for water-based dyes. Basically, it'll be a component that you might normally see in a top coat finish. Well, some premixed dye stains will have a binder in it and you need to know how this is gonna affect your work. Now think of the binder as a glue or some kind of a sealer. It serves to lock that color into the wood and at least partially seals the surface. Normally, a water-based dye will reactivate when you rub it with a wet paper towel, but if there's a binder in the mix, much less of that color is gonna come up. Let me show you an example. Now, this is just a straight powdered dye that I used on here, and if I spray it with water, it was a water-based dye, I will spray this guy with some water. Now, water will start to reactivate the dye, which means when I rub it with a clean paper towel, I'm gonna get a lot of color transfer onto the, uh, the paper towel. I could also, I mean, this can come in handy. If the color is too dark after dyeing, I could put some fresh water on it, rub it down, and uh, get the color to look a little bit lighter, you know, so it's not too late. You know, sometimes you stain or paint a surface. Once it's on there, it's on there. So that's regular dye. Now this is a General Finishes dye stain, which does have a little bit of binder in it. Not a lot. So we could still uh, pull some color up, but it's, it's not gonna be nearly as much color. Okay, so we got a little bit there, but really not a lot. So the binder serves to lock that color in. Now there are a lot of great dye products out there. And while I don't want to tell you what products to use, I will tell you what products I rely on time and time again. Now if I want to use a powdered dye, I usually reach for this TransFast stuff. It's pretty widely available, relatively inexpensive, and they come in a great variety of colors. Now I have both the water-soluble and the alcohol-soluble versions, but most often I wind up using the water-soluble. In the liquid concentrate category, I like to use TransTint. The product information and MSDS tell us that it contains a metal acid dye, which means it's a little bit more light fast than other dyes, and it also contains glycol ethers. So that means it dissolves in just about anything we put it in. And I use this stuff primarily for toning. Just a few drops into a can of lacquer, water-based poly, or shellac, and I've got a great way to add subtle color to any project. And finally, in the ready-to-use category, I have my new favorite, it's General Finishes dye stains. Now these stains are incredibly easy to work with and they come in a variety of colors. You can mix and match the colors to achieve a completely custom look and you can even add this stuff to just about any water-based top coat. Now looking at the MSDS, we see that it not only contains a glycol ether, it also contains an acrylic polymer and water. So the glycol ether was used to dissolve the acrylic and the dye and the concentrate was then diluted with water. Now the acrylic in the mix does act as a binder, but they've managed to add the perfect amount so that the color sticks to the surface, but it still allows subsequent coats of dyes to penetrate in case you want to layer color. Now it's interesting to note that if this stuff were in its concentrated form and it didn't contain so much water, we'd have something very similar to TransTint, which is a universal dye concentrate that's compatible with just about any finish. But since so much water has been added to this product, it's pretty much committed to the world of water. And honestly, that's perfectly fine with me. Now, if you're applying the finish by hand, I recommend sticking with the water-based dyes. They give you a decent amount of working time, unlike an alcohol-based dye, which can streak pretty easily. But keep in mind, the water-based stuff can streak too. So let's apply dye to a few test panels and I'll show you how I like to do it. So the first step is to pre-wet the surface because we're going to use a water-based dye. Now whether you mix your own water-based, like from powder here, or if you use this uh, pre-mixed stuff, you're still going to get some grain raising. 
this material doesn't raise the grain quite as much as just using standard dye in water, but it still does. So just to be safe, I like to get the entire surface nice and wet. Some distilled water in a spray bottle is perfect for this. Let it soak in. Just kind of rub it into the surface. You don't have to go crazy, just make sure it's, for the most part, wet in every single part of the board. If you missed a few spots, you go over it a second time. Now I'm gonna let that dry for about an hour. And the great thing about this step is this really does, even though it's just water, it really does highlight some of the flaws that might be in the surface. So if you've missed something, this is where you're gonna see it. Now it's been about 45 minutes, the surface feels nice and dry, and it certainly has raised the grain. So a piece of 320 grit sandpaper, a very light sanding will knock that grain down and get us ready for the dye. Now what I'm actually doing here is a test board for my Aurora table, uh, the one that I learned to make with uh, Daryl Peart. And his mixture is seven parts of General Finish's orange and four parts of General Finish's medium brown. And that's what I have right here all mixed up. These things are perfectly compatible with one another, so you just mix them up and you're good to go. So I'll be doing a few different experiments here, but I'll show you the different application methods using this as I make my test boards. Now, you can apply pretty easily with a foam brush like this and then just wipe off the excess. That's certainly one way. You could also just dip the rag right into the mix and wipe it on. Um, but I, I think I prefer the sponge uh, more than anything else. But here's another option. You could put the dye into a simple spray bottle and spritz it all over the surface. And that's great for covering large areas in a, in a very short amount of time. And of course, you could always use an HVLP system, um, you know, a traditional finishing system to spread the co color on evenly, and you don't necessarily even have to wipe it off at that point because it, it spreads it so nice and even over the surface. So let's start by flooding the surface with a sponge brush. I like to get the surface good and wet. Now you'll see the wood is very thirsty. It pulls in that water very, very aggressively and pulls in the color as well. So the idea here is to flood the surface. Let the wood pick up as much as it wants to pick up in terms of color. And if you do that, you can actually get much more consistent results because you can vary the intensity of your color by changing your formula but not necessarily by your application method. Okay, that's just another variable you throw in the mix. So I keep it nice and wet like this for a couple seconds. Let it take as much as it wants in. Get a nice clean cotton rag. And wipe off the excess with the grain. Wow. Let me tell you, Daryl's recommendation is spot on because that is gorgeous. Now, if you notice that the wood starts taking up the finish a little bit too aggressively and starts pulling in that color, one trick that you can do, this isn't a bad idea for larger work surfaces, is to spritz the surface with water first. Let that soak in. So basically the really, really thirsty green is gonna pull in the clear water instead of pulling in all that color. And with the pre-wet surface, we can now go back to wiping on the dye. Now, if you have a good spray bottle, you can actually use that to spritz the, uh, the dye on. And I just realized, see, I don't normally use a spray bottle to do this, and I just borrowed this one uh, from the house, and I realized it has no really fine mist setting. It only has the stream setting. <laughs> So uh, let's use our imaginations and pretend that this is a gentle, fine mist. And what I'm spraying here is a slight variation of Daryl's color mix. Uh, what I've done is added one part yellow. And that little tiny bit of yellow could very well just add a little bit of a fiery glow. We've already got the orange in there. The yellow will tend to brighten things up a little bit. 
and uh, kind of go on, on the opposite end of the spectrum from the medium brown. So I'm just doing it as an experiment, and if I like it, I'll use it on the actual piece. And just for fun, we're going to make our own dye from some water-soluble powder. Now the instructions on this TransFast dye says to use two quarts of hot distilled water and one ounce of dye. Now one ounce of dye is basically, well, this whole thing. So I really don't want to do that. I'm just going to do a small sample here just to give you an idea of what you can expect. Now do your best not to disturb too much of this powder dust and get it in the air because you do not want to breathe it. Okay. Give it a good mix. Now keep in mind, when you mix your own stuff from powder, you do want to be a lot more careful than I'm being. You want to keep track of exactly how much powder you put into how much water because you're going to want to reproduce this result in the future, especially for a larger project. You need a lot more of this stuff than you think you do sometimes. So it's pretty well mixed. I'm going to use the little sponge, sponge brush to put it on the surface and uh, we'll see how well it applies. Okay. Just going to flood it on like we did before. Now this is all water, so you can see it's going to really drink it up really fast. Doesn't give you a whole lot of time to come back and wipe off the excess. So you can see how on a larger surface that could be a bit of a problem because your start and stop points are going to become really visible. Obviously, I would normally use a, a larger brush to do this so I can cover more surface area faster. And notice, this is a birch plywood, which is notoriously very splotchy, and there is no shortage of uneven absorption here, so even dyes suffer from that problem as well. So while our test panel dries, let's talk a little bit about the top coat. Because when it comes to dye, you have to be very careful about what you choose and how you apply it. Now if this were just a simple powder dye that we mixed with water and applied to the surface, we'd have to be really careful because if we just hit it with a water-based top coat, the water in this material could very well reactivate that dye and lift it into the finish and kind of just, it just makes things look murky and not very good. So we want to make sure the dye that's on that surface stays on the surface. Because really, if you think about it, the simplest dye is literally just the dye particle and some sort of solvent. And once that solvent evaporates, all you're left with is the dye particles that are on the wood grain. So you want to make sure that you lock that stuff down. So what I recommend doing is locking it in with some de-waxed shellac. Seal coat is a great example of that. Now, you still can pull some of the color off with the shellac, so you have to be very careful about how you apply it. If you could spray it, perfect, because then you could just lay a light mist down on the surface that locks everything down. But if you can't spray, you're going to have to wipe it on. And what I recommend doing is using very quick, light strokes and just put a nice little coat on there, almost like a very quick French polish. You want to just touch down to the surface and come right off the end and then lock that grain down. And if you can get some shellac in a spray can, just for the purpose of this first seal coat, probably not a bad idea. And then after that point, you can hit it with as many coats, as thick as you want, of whatever type of finish you want, and it's not going to disturb the color. Also, if you don't have the shellac on hand, and all you really have is your top coat, you can get away with that. Just make sure that your first coat is just very light, and be careful, don't apply too thick of a coat, because that will have a tendency to reactivate that dye. Now, all that being said, that's exactly why I like this general finishes stuff because it does have a little bit of binder in it, which means it's gonna have less of a tendency to pull up into the top coat that we choose to use, even if you just go with a water-based top coat. So I find that these are a little bit more flexible and wind up requiring less of me in terms of extra steps uh, to make sure that the color stays on the surface. All right, now with the dye completely dried at this point, this is where you have to be really careful. So I'm gonna use a little bit of shellac and see if I could just use a really light touch and apply just a, a nice light coat 
that will lock everything down. Obviously, again, spraying and all of this, uh, if you have an HVLP, a turbine system, spraying is always going to be easier. Um, but I like to approach this assuming that you don't have a sprayer. So a little bit of seal coat, which if I recall is approximately two pound cut. And I just realized one thing I need to do here is get a secondary container. Duh. Obviously, dipping a rag with dye on it back into the original container is not a good idea. All right, so the powdered material that we made ourselves is actually holding up pretty well to this alcohol and, and shellac mixture here. So this is a real good sign, very promising result. I'm actually rubbing about the same that I would on a raw piece of wood, and that's not too bad. It's really not much on there. Now, once this dries, you're pretty much ready to put on any top coat that you want. And now here's our test board that we use the uh, General Finishes dye stains on. And I expect that to hold up just as well. See, and even if you get a little bit of color on your pad, that doesn't necessarily mean that you're doing any serious damage. What you need to look at is the surface of the wood to see if you're actually pulling a significant amount of color up and changing the way it looks. And in this case, Looks pretty good to me. Not bad. So as you can see, the world of dyes is pretty cool. Uh, you can do a lot with it. You have bright, vivid colors. Um, you know, the newer formulations are pretty light fast. You still want to be careful about UV exposure. You don't want these things being in direct sunlight because they will fade. Um, you have to be realistic. But at the same time, all those things satisfied, you can get some really impressive looking pieces just by using a little bit of dye. Now keep in mind, I only reviewed, you know, what I consider to be the stuff that the average woodworker is going to confront. Uh, in our travels as we go through finishing. Um, there's a lot of different varieties out there. There's some exceptions to the rules that we've talked about, and uh, I won't pretend to have used all of them. I just, at this point, use what I'm uh, very comfortable with and what has given me great results in the past, and I think it'll work for you too. So, on your next project, when you need to color something, think about using some dye. It's a great product.